Hello and welcome to On The Curbs. I'm your host, Tima Albers Daily. Joining me for this episode is racing driver Isabella Abrio. While still very much in the early stages of her racing career, Isabella seems to have figured out the balance between combining a sensible approach and an ever so slightly crazy approach when it comes to learning everything that she'll need to know in order to thrive in the motorsport world. We talked about this when we caught up recently, as well as what her experience has been like as a young woman in racing so far, how 2023 gave her the experience she needed to take the challenges of 2024 head on, and much more. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Isabella. Thank you very much for being here today. First of all, how are you? Good. I'm pretty good. <laughs> you? That's good. Yeah, I'm also pretty good, thank you. And excited to, <laughs> to chat with you today because there's a fair bit to go through. Um, which you seem to have packed into a short amount of time, so I'm excited to see how, you, how you've managed to do all of that. But first of all, I've got to ask, when did you first get interested in motorsport? Well, the interest came about when I was younger, but I started getting more into motorsports when I was 16 years old. Okay, and what led to that then? Just like you say, interested, but then what went from an interest to you want to be part yes. of it? So the interest was my dad uh, was a mechanic in Cuba. I was born in Cuba and uh, I just saw him and like working in the old cars, you know, the Beatles mm-hmm. and the, you know, the the old cars. And I was just so excited to be in the garage and just put like uh, gasoline and stuff. <laughs> in my <face. laughs> So that's where the interest sparked. And then the motorsports was, um, you know, I just love cars. <laughs> no, that's, that's fair enough. Did you do any... I mean, I'm not really across the motorsport scene in Cuba. If there is much of one. Did you get the chance to do anything there, or did you have to go to the US to to pursue that bit of the dream straight off? So there's communism in Cuba. Um, so me and my family left. We fled the country, fled the country to Spain, and moved to the US. And that's where I was able to okay. start my career. With, yeah. <laughs> Spain in between to to keep me on my toes there. Right, I got you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you got into karting then, I presume that was in the US, then you didn't do that in Spain and you just you wait until you got, got a bit more settled perhaps. Right. Yep, um, yep, yep. How was all of that? Like, Tell me all about the, the karting career. So my karting career started when I was 15, 16. Um, I started in something called 206, which is a uh, four-stroke. It's really slow. So that's where I learned all my... Um, corner work my line and then I went up to two strokes and I started getting more into like the fast pace you have to know what you're doing faster in the corners and all that I did um my karting races mostly in Florida um and AMR Motorflex in Homestead um the U.S. (laughs) and um, and then um then I jumped into cars (laughs) I think yeah, correct me if I remember, I've had this with, with other drivers. Were you frustrated that you had to start off in something that you just just of yourself as being very slow, but it's kind of right. it's a weird necessary step to learn the basics to get kind of familiar with everything so that as much as you wish you could jump straight into the Ferrari, for example, yeah. you've got to do it with the, with the slow kind of vehicles first. I'm not going to say you don't get frustrated, which you do, <laughs> but it, it's, the, it's the baseline to know what you're going to be doing. If I hadn't started in my karting career, I think I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. Or at least I would be doing it, but not as, you know. Not as well, good. perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, last year you made the step up in the cars then? Yes, I did. What was that transition like for you? It was scary because I don't know if you know but the Miatas are um spec Miata is a manual I did not know how to drive a manual so I spent <laughs> around like a week renting out manual cars I, I rented a Fiat 500 for a week and just stalled it like 3,000 times in the highway you know and um the first ever I had to get my license which was my uh SCCA license and it was the scariest thing to be out on track because the karting track does not compare at all to the big tracks of <laughs> you know everybody. And it was really scary, but then I got the hang of it. <laughs> it's one of those things with manuals. you it's it's annoying at first in some respects, like you say, stalling is, is a natural part of it, but it's just that repetition, that practice that you've got to do to get 
get the hang of that. And then it, it's a theory isn't difficult. It's just making sure that you keep it all and just repeat, repeat, repeat all the time. Exactly. And that's why I think uh, I've, I'm more, um, I feel safer in the car now that I know how to drive manual. <laughs> so now that you know what you're doing. Races, I was not, I, I did Daytona. My first race ever was in Daytona and I did an endurance race with my friend and I just, I wasn't competitive at all <laughs> knowing that I didn't know how to drive for uh, the car, neither the line because of my karting background, but I just didn't know how to drive the car. So yeah. Well, you read my mind a bit there because I was going to ask you about Daytona because that was back in yeah. September. So this was before you'd gone out on the road practicing in the manual car. This was just you jumping in expecting to be able to do it. Exactly. Well, I had <laughs> gotten my um my novice permit for SCCA the month before, which is the first time I was ever in a manual car. I mean, race car, race car in general. And then I went to the Tona right after, which was crazy because, you know, a novice person in a race car going to the Tona, which is such a big track. So it's such a famous track. You didn't make it, was, it easy for yourself. Oh, I didn't. I did not. And I honestly, I don't regret anything. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think that uh, probably took, you know, the scariness out of the question. But it was insane. It was, uh, I was sideways going into the bankings and I was like, oh my God, hopefully like the car doesn't shut down now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those things, I suppose, the benefit of uh, in hindsight, probably not thinking that at the time because you're just trying to figure out how the hell to get through the race, but right. it's that you've thrown yourself in at the deep end in theory after that it's not going to get any worse and you know what to expect later so you know what to do about it whereas if you build up to it there's still that fear of the unknown in some respects I suppose. That's exactly how we thought of it um and you know it, it worked out so <laughs> I threw myself yeah. in the deep end and you know now I am not scared of Daytona now I'm not. <laughs> well that's good because it's a great racetrack so it'd be a shame if you'd be afraid of going back there. Oh my, I, I think I'm coming going back in like one or two months and I'm really because that's one of my favorite racetracks in Florida now. Well, so you're, getting, <laughs> you're getting quite familiar with them let's say at this point so right. it's good to good to know which ones you definitely want to be, be doing well and that you like them as well so what was the rest of the um, experience at Daytona like? What is, I mean obviously you've learned quite a bit do you think I'm kind of jumping ahead on my own thing here but was there something that you learned in that race particular that's helped you the most since then in your driving? I think that race, it was, you know, the um, the track. It was a difficult track. It was a big track. It was way different than the Homestead track uh, down in Miami, hmm. which is my old track. <laughs> that's the one I've always seen. Since it was such a difficult slash big track, I think, you know, the nerves and um, mechanically speaking, I learned my race car. Also, that was the first day I had my my personal race car. We had bought it the weekend before and we spec'd it out for that race. And um, I got to know my car very well with that track. Um, just, you know, the, the last couple corners going into the big straightaway. Those were the hardest corners I've ever done in my entire life. I was scared the whole time. But as the weekend went about, um, you know, getting to know my car, getting to know, you know, the track more. I think by the end of that weekend, um, you know, I learned what I know now. <laughs> so in the same way that the karting helped set you up to get into oh, yeah. this kind of driving, this was kind of like, the next step in that you're not going slowly but it's kind of you know, this is the racing version of that so that in the, exactly. in the future you should be more prepared for all of it it's insane how um you know when you are in the karting world you think oh yeah it's just you know racing but it sets you up perfectly to what you're going to be doing in the race car world because you get to know you know the throttle breaking points you get to know the line perfectly it's 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 very difficult karting, but that difficulty sets you up perfectly for the, you know, car, race car world formula even, you know. And you see that still with the really experienced drivers in their downtime going back and just doing some karting and you think, what can you possibly still be learning from this? But then they oh, somehow wow. find something and yeah. they play it in the next Grand Prix they do or the next yeah. IndyCar race and they, they 
you know, like it seems weird that something so basic can help something so advanced but and yet like you say it does work yep and you know like it, since it is carding people would be like oh why are you doing carding it's such such, such a small little cart i'm like okay you don't know the basis of everything <laughs> Gets a bad rep, but they're probably thinking, why are you not further along? It's like, no, trust me, it's going right. to help me get where I need yeah. to go. Yep, yep. Exactly. So then Daytona was part of last year, and you were stepping into cars for the first time. Talk to me about the rest of 2023 and how that then prepared you for this year. Okay, so my rest of 2023, I was in between finishing my licensing process for SCCA in Sebring, in between Homestead and Sebring, uh, Florida, which is Sebring is one of it's my favorite track so far because it's so difficult. So close and, second to Daytona, or was it ahead of Daytona? Yeah, yeah, and it's funny you 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 speak about the the karting because it's it's basically a big karting track with all the corners and all. You have to know what you're doing for that track. If not, you're straight into a wall. You know. <laughs> um. So I I finished up my licensing process. Um. I think in October I finished and then I got my NASA license, which is another licensing uh, process that I had to get, and which is an or other organization. And then I did my FARA license, you know. Yeah, the one <laughs> you were very happy did. about. Right. Um, and I did, I don't know how many races, I think in, in the middle of 12 to 15 after that Daytona race. Uh, and I think... I think now I'm more certain that I can, I'm not going to say I know everything because I don't, I am making a lot of mistakes. I just started this, but um, I do feel more confident at the racetrack now that I have those, that experience of getting to know different tracks and, you know, coming in, jumping in one day and then the, the race is the next day, you know, in karting, we had a month uh, preparation for one local race. And here you only have maybe, if you're lucky, one or two days, you know, to prepare. I think that's a good thing, though. I mean, granted, speaking as an outside person looking in, so maybe you can you'll disagree. But that element again of being thrown deep end, you've got that month in karting, like you were saying. Right. But then again, if something goes wrong on the race, it feels like doesn't matter how much preparation you've got, you you'll need that race to get the true experience of it. Whereas if you switch it around, you have more seat time in the races and feeling what that right. whole atmosphere is like and right. you say yourself you're making a lot of mistakes but i think that's a crucial part of it as well because and the attitude you seem to be taking to it and because you seem open-minded with it not you're probably annoyed in the moment that you're making mistakes but you maybe get over that quicker than other people would because you know that it's all part of it you're not going to know everything at this stage that's virtually impossible and like you like we were saying as well drivers much more experienced than you 20 years plus of driving experience they're still going back to karting to see what they can learn so you've got this this balance of it yeah it's just kind of that open-mindedness to it that i think is going to benefit you in the long term then because you just got that confidence still but you're not getting overconfident with it if that makes sense exactly I, I'm confident in my abilities as a driver, but I know I can learn so much more. That's why every time somebody comes up to me like, you're doing this corner and you could do this way better, I listen and I'm, I ask more questions because it's always any grain of, of information or help that anybody can give me, I take like if, if it were, you know, gold because it's, it's, um, I, I apply everything that, you know, all the help that everybody gives me uh, into the race. Even though, you know, race car drivers, when we get into the car, we don't really think. We <laughs> we do. We subconsciously, we know that, okay, this person told, told me this and this person told me that. And let's try this and let's see what works for me, you know. And um, I I am very open minded in that way. But at the same time, I do, like you said, um, get in my own head and, and, and get stressed out because, you know, you want to do everything perfectly off the bat, you know, but it, it's always seat time. It's always practice. And I I definitely think that I need a lot more seat time. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, you're in one of those sports where it's not easy or cheap to get a lot more seat time. You can't just go onto a tennis court and get it that way like anyone else could if they're doing that sport, for example. Exactly. Like, this isn't tennis. I can't just buy a racket. No, you have to be at the track. 
then you were racing in Miami back in February, back in Homestead, and you had a pretty good time of it, to be fair. So tell us a bit about that. I mean, first in both categories that you competed in, how long did it take that winning feeling to sink in? And you were switching between two categories, am I right? And what was that yep. switch like over the course of the weekend? So this is the first time I've ever done uh, double dipping, which is what we call it. Um, my personal race car is a GT4A uh, car, which means it's really tuned. It's not spec, which is uh, the car as itself. It cannot compete in uh, the spec class. It's really it's not fast, but it's faster than the average, um, you know, spec Miata. So going from, you know, fast pace to slower paced cars, then slower paced cars to fast paced cars. I was able to learn in one weekend what I hadn't learned in like three months. Because going from a slow car into a faster car, I was I was able to be like, oh, so I can go faster here and then um go slower in here for my the the faster car. So just it was a really fun and really challenging experience running from one race to the other because we did not have time in between. I I went straight from one car to the other, but um, I loved it. Honestly, I'm going to be doing that uh, this weekend in the Farah Grand Prix as well. Does it feel that much slower when you switch from the fast car to the slow car and vice versa, or was there not really enough time for you to process that and that, that came later because like you say you just literally went straight from one to the other it was it, it you can notice the difference in horsepower uh the corners you know going from in going into a corner a fast-paced corner in a fast-paced car you oversold the car and then you get out because faster because you have the horsepower to leave the corner faster but in the spec miata it's a challenging you know I don't know. It's it's very challenging to race the spec Miata because you have to go in fast into the corner or slow into one corner and then maintain the engine horsepower to leave that corner better. You know, you've got to be more so constant rather than being able to slow and get faster. Right. Yeah. It's very much different, and and I noticed it. It it was noticeable. <laughs> Were you sitting there at points, just kind of chugging the car and going, "Come on, oh, quicker." Yeah. Oh, and- I was able to sing songs while I was racing <laughs> in the Spike Miata and the other car you can't even listen to yourself because of how loud it is, you know? I would have criticized, but you came first, so that's clearly a good way to make <laughs> it work for yourself. <laughs> yeah. But when you said about the winning, I, I um this was it was really fun. Well, in December, back in December, I won uh, I got second place in an endurance race with Vara and then mm. with now going into the gt4a class and and far i was able to win the sprint race and the endurance race as well which is challenging but doable but the spec miata class oh my gosh i also did not fit in my rental i was renting a car by then did not fit in there so i had like pillows i don't know if that's legal but i had pillows in the (laughs) back of my, my race car seat and i couldn't reach the pedals all the way so yeah an extra level of challenge that perhaps you didn't need. Oh. But it just also goes to show that, as we were talking about before, all this throwing you in the deep end, all this experience you've been gaining, is clearly paying off already. Oh, yeah. 100%. I, I don't know why I throw myself so much in the deep end. <laughs> if, it, if it works, it works. So, you know, that's, that's, the mo- that's the main thing. It'd be more frustrating if you did all of this. And I suppose you could be doing all of that and... It still depends on how you would approach the race weekend, how you approach it afterwards in terms of analyzing and learning. So that combination, it just shows that while, yeah, you are maybe a little crazy for doing that, you've got, there is a sensible part of you as well that's going, there is a logical reason for this and I can learn a lot from it and you are getting the right bits pulled out of all of it. Exactly. And it's not only me. I mean, there's a lot of amazing people like my team, through Logistics, they are, uh, they helped me out with all those strategies. So the strategy of going to Daytona was actually their idea. And I was... Oh, you're, blaming, you know, you're blaming them for this now. I see what's going on. But, I mean, I'm crazy too if I did it. So I agreed. <laughs> you're complicit, yeah. Right. So, yeah. The, it's it's all, it's all, you know, 
it's all part of the learning process, throwing myself in the deep end. But I would not, I would never trade it for it. a singular. I, I'd, I'd rather throw myself into the deep end than, than not. How much work behind the scenes do you do in terms of getting involved with the stuff the team would specifically look at? I'm thinking data. I'm thinking how the car's tuned. Like you say, the, there's one of your cars is more tuned than the other. And how much of that do you do you just get the brief about that and they tell you what they've done, or do you try and listen and be there when they're doing this stuff and try and just soak as much of it in as you can? So, uh, in terms of knowing mechanically what they're doing, I try my hardest to just peep my head in and and, and watch and and ask questions, but I let them do their thing because one thing that I learned in karting is that if 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 the mechanic tells you what they did you're going to be in your head and know and think, oh my gosh, they did this so it's wrong. And I, I feel it in the steering and I feel it in the... So I try to s- distance myself from anything, uh, not mechanically, but but um, I guess tuning wise, like if they uh, toe in, toe out, you know, anything having to do with that, I don't, uh, you know, focus don't on it. Like, and if I notice something different, I tell them I didn't like this, I didn't like that. But behind the scenes, um, we're going into, you know, going into races. Um, I do a lot of, you know, shows. I just came from uh, a show I did, car shows, to, uh, car shows with Farah, uh, to, you know, tell the public, hey, this is, there's a race going on. Here are some tickets, you know. I also do simulator work as well. I, you know, do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of, you know, laps around Homestead or on Sebring or on Daytona. If you I should go be able to do it blindfolded by now, I reckon. <laughs> I am so tired of Homestead. <laughs> <laughs> In the best possible way. We'll just we'll carry about with that. <laughs> exactly. I'm tired, but I guess I know the track now. <laughs> I'd hope so hope so yeah. I'll, be very, I'll be very frustrated <laughs> if you start going off in some random direction in the next race you have right now. <laughs> yep so can you then share your plans for the rest of 2024 are you sticking with this category for the whole time or are you adding some other bits in you're not sure yet what's what's going on so i started i want to start more into the spec class a slower class um because that helps me out to get into you know either the master shootout or you know anything in the top levels mx5 or something like i just want to keep being consistent in the spec class while also being you know doing the fun stuff in the gt4a i you know the spec class would be my my serious attempt to further my career and then the GT4A class is more to, like, to have fun. GT4A and ITS and SCCA. Yeah. Because, yeah, there's there's two different approaches. The one sensible one, like you say, and then the other one where you can have the fun, but you also don't know what kind of doors that might open as well and exactly. what you can maybe apply from that that will help you in, in a sensible path, let's say. Because right. that's one of the things I always talk with drivers about is that, especially when they switch from wildly different disciplines, it's always fascinating to see, see what you can apply from single seater to rallying or vice versa for example you'd never think that there's a lot in common but it's like going back to the cutting there's a surprising amount that you can harness from one to put into the other so again crazy but sensible approach from you exactly and, and and you know doing the two classes yes i'm doing the serious you know spec me out i want to get somewhere with that but the gt4a even though i'm doing it for fun it's also experience and faster paced cars mm-hmm. you know it's so seat regarding time. seat time and experience in, in, in the sense of, you know, every weekend is challenging both psychologically <laughs> and physically, because I don't know why, but I lose like two pounds <laughs> every weekend. <laughs> so hopefully not much of that is down to stress and more just the physical side of things rather than anything. Oh, right. An endurance race, you know, I, I run cool shirts, but sometimes my cool shirt doesn't work and I start sweating profusely and it's it's that that's what I so mean. So Miami's because not known for being a cold place either, so Oh my gosh. Tell me about it. I get a tan. I don't know why, but I get a tan every weekend and I'm like burning up. I say with that much exposure, you can use it by now. Your skin's clearly just not not getting what's going on here. <laughs> it's not used to it. 
Oh, I mean, I, I used to live, I just moved to Miami to con to further my racing career again, but um, I was living in New Jersey and, and throughout the whole uh, 2023, I was just, every race weekend, I had to travel down to Florida and then go back to school on a Monday. And, and it was, it was really challenging in that way as well. <laughs> I'm going to say how much on a Monday morning were you wishing it was already Friday? Oh my gosh. You know, every single race weekend, I would wake up in the Mondays and be like, I'm going to Florida this weekend to race. Yay. Is there, and was there anyone that kind of understood that, that mindset from you or was it like other friends in, in the same situation or is it just you in the class and it's like, this is just a crazy girl going off to do racing in Florida on the weekends? It was only me. It Nobody <laughs> in school, all the teachers were like, why are you doing, and it's like, it's my sport, you know, it, it's like, it's like I swimmers. wish I could do it after school, but I can't, so I've got to go to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's why I, I chose to do online right now and move back mm -hmm. to Florida because I'm doing so much of you know, racing uh, behind the scenes and, you know, at the racetrack that traveling back and forth was not an option <laughs> anymore. So the amount of time you're saving there is is crucial. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You touched on something I did want to talk about, though, because while it is becoming more common sight, it's still not seen as the norm by many. Um, so I'm curious, what's your experience been like as a young woman getting into motorsport? It's very challenging, but... The people around me and the racetrack, they do their, you know, they're really good at including me into everything, including other girls as well. They, It's not as sexist as one would say, mm -hmm. but my experience going into it was challenging at first because, you know, once you, I'm not going to say get good, but once you start progressing and, and being a bit better in the racetrack, People look at you in a different way. And being a girl, um, I've had, you know, people, you know, cheat and and, and change my engines and like do, do me dirty, crash me out on purpose. But, you know, you surpass that and learn from those experiences. And I think, you know, being what some weekends, I'm the only girl at the racetrack. I think it's not it's not as different as one would think as an outside perspective, I think everybody does, you know, once the helmet's on, nobody cares how, what gender you are. Yeah, you're just racing the clock at that point and everyone else around you. And that was one of the things I did like at Homestead because I did actually watch the uh, the whole weekend there of racing. And the all three categories, I think there was at least one woman in each of them. And that was just refreshing to see because I don't think I was necessarily expecting that. I mean, it's it's unexpected to see even me as a girl. I, you know, it's unexpected to see other women driving, and I look at them. You know, there's older women driving that I'm like, how do you do it? I want to be you when I'm older, <laughs> because it's it's such a small community of women in racing that it's it's very not weird. It's not weird, but it's impressive a little bit to see a girl. You know be at the racetrack every weekend and you know race fast cars and 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 endure like that heavy you know um physical how do you call it you know strain i guess to race a race yeah, car because yeah. you got a muscle i have to <laughs> they told me I have to, <laughs> they do exist I have, to, I have to go to the gym they told me i had to go to the gym because and do arms because i wasn't steering hard enough <laughs> So that's again. You're you're teeing up these questions to me perfectly here by just by setting yourself up so nicely. That I appreciate it. What then do you think is the most important thing you've learned in your career so far that's helped you? I and mean, we touched about that a little bit. They turned really, but is there one thing that you jumps out of you either for on or off track help that's just you noticed there was a before I learned this and there's an after I learned this. I think it's. And it's going to be an expected answer, unexpected answer, but I think an emotional intelligence was probably the thing that I most learned when I started racing, because when 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 you're young, as I started in, in racing, you you involve your emotions way too much, and that's how you make mistakes. And 
once you realize that you have to keep a wall up and 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 control your emotions in the sense of if you crash out you crashed out it already happened you know if you won you won but don't you know it's it's the fact that you have to be intelligent in how you think and feel the emotions you're feeling at the racetrack because at the racetrack it's so much going on all at once and it's so many things you have to know and 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 apply that you have to keep a steady mind you take a bit of time out at the end of a weekend to process everything or do you not always get the opportunity and you just got to kind of rush that and just be dealing with it first thing Monday morning you just got to get on with whatever's next I go into a race weekend not expecting anything and if if anything happens it happens and after that I it was the race weekend. I did not, you, just you know, shut it I and you're done. just shut it and continue on for the next one. It's fair enough. I mean, it's, it's nice if you can do it, I suppose. So, it's, is that easy to? Were you always like that, or was is that something that oh, no. is part of this? That's why you know I learned that from karting because karting, you know, it's it's very a family oriented sport because me and my dad went to the track and like we 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 did our own thing and you know everybody's. And knowing that me and my dad put on so much work into this, and then I crashed out in the weekend, it's it's it did not go so well emotionally. So that's why I learned slowly but surely, hey, it happened. Let's go on to the next race. Again, easier said than done, I imagine, because you again that frustration, especially in the moment of I've done all this work and you just think it's all for nothing, but like no, there's stuff that you could learn from it, but you don't want to hear that at that moment because you're annoyed that you've crashed out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm still learning it. I mean, I'm not fully, yeah. you know <laughs> You're not fully Zen I'm, monk yet. I'm not I I mean it's easier said than done, like you said. It's 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 difficult. One would think the racing is the hardest part, but it's it's honestly not everything combined. With that in mind, do you have an ultimate mode sport dream that you'd like to achieve? Well, I do, but um, you know, it's difficult being that I just started in cars. Um I would want to continue, you know, racing Spike Miata and all, but I, my motorsports dream would probably be, you know, either MX-5 Cup or maybe in the future, I don't know, Manifestation, maybe racing Porsches. <laughs> okay. Are you thinking more in terms of the endurance racing then? Your kind of, that's your ticket or is, or are you just kind of, let's see where this path goes for a bit and then let's see what's out there. I mean, I take it as it comes. Uh, I think everything having to do with cars, I would completely love. I would, I would never expect a year from today that I would be racing race cars and you know doing all that I'm doing right now. So, if the opportunity comes, I will not be sad about it. I would be excited, even if it's you know whatever car. I would just happen to be in the race car. I think that's a good approach to have as well, because like you say, you're still young and starting off in your career and you just want to be open to everything. And like you say, you've got this two track system at the moment of sensible and crazy, but helpful. Um, so again, you've got these parallel tracks going on, but there's that bit of switching between the two as it goes along. And I think, like you say, when you've got that, that emotional intelligence to take that step back a little bit and just analyze it, then you can see everything a lot more clear and you can see what, what the options are and how to get where you want to go in theory then so whilst those two things are maybe what you want now you know that that's it looks like the end goal now but then you get there maybe or you get close to and you see all these other avenues that might be of interest and you know that you've not ruled yourself out for them that's exactly how and 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 to be fair i also need seed time before i i do any of the further you know the big stuff big dreams that i wanted to (laughs) definitely I mean, this, there's never enough seat time it feels like yep i feel like even professionals you know in the big leagues need seat well, you hear about in formula one now they're saying we still don't have enough time for practice I'm like you're a formula one driver come on get over it exactly i, I mean you know you you see you see alonso at the at the karting track almost like every mm-hmm. weekend you know they still need the the practice so yeah 
a couple of fun questions to finish off, Ben. What is your favourite film? My favourite film, probably The Wolf of Wall Street. Okay, good choice. I like it. And then, would you rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or a horse-sized duck? A horse-sized duck. Okay. Okay. Not many people go for that. They always go for... I feel like a lot of people, they prefer the smaller things. I'm not entirely sure why. I think one big thing is a lot easier to deal with. Exactly. And it's fluffy, the the duck. (laughs) I don't think that part comes into it, but okay. (laughs) I mean, yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, and I want to thank you very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to seeing you go racing this weekend, which will probably be a couple of weekends ago by the time this comes out, but there's plenty more racing for you to do in the future, and wish you the best of luck for the rest of 2024. And thank you so much. It was a pleasure meeting you and being in this interview. Thank you again to Isabella for taking the time to chat. Wishing her the best of luck for everything in 2024. Details of where you can find both Isabella and I on social media and everywhere else will be in the description of this episode, so do go and check that out. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon.